let's go to the filament maker first since uh, don't have the cat here but we do have this so I just put this up 2110 so 21 is the year 21 like we do the version by year um, just a little note on this nomenclature stuff it's there's the 50 GVCS machines and they all follow this taxonomy and and the way like I'm, I'm able to basically find anything on a wiki over the last decade or two like in a second uh, but I do keep a particular way to organize. I think it makes sense. It's based on regular taxonomy of product development plus nomenclature of what all the steps of product development are. So if you understand that nomenclature, you can pretty much say, okay, here's the OSC film and maker cat. But you also have to version. Like the versioning part is what makes things blow up a lot of times. Like first when we started the wiki, it was awesome, great. We built the track, you know, the brick press, this and that. Everything got seeded. And then when it came time to the second iteration, pretty much everything blew up on the wiki because it's like, okay, where do I put it? Is it, do I continue the old version, etc.? And it's like, of course, you can use GitHub. <clears throat> the wiki is convenient for a little lower entry level than GitHub. Um, you can readily set up the wiki where you're just putting all the content on GitHub too and then you're just downloading the whole Git clone thing. You, you can do that readily from the wiki so that you can pretty much transfer all this that way hasn't been done but uh, the wiki does have its own versioning system like all the files you upload new files even the pictures like if you want to see how a, a particular design evolves well we <coughs> upload the CAD as soon as possible but then we also upload little thumbnails in galleries like <coughs> here's a non-existent library but for example in this 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 thing, there's you know little pictures and part libraries like that where, uh, like for example, if you click on this, you can actually see the history of that of how that evolved. So, in this, you have file history. You know, so it's actually very convenient. You can study how the design evolved. And for example, here, okay, that's the start. We started with the shafts. I just did this, and I uploaded the next version, etc. Uh, but there are there is a bit of internal versioning happening. On the wiki itself so it's useful to to understand it and here just with the filament maker uh, just this thing like the 2110 you know for the next you know I will I will know that okay in the year 21 in October it helps me to organize it and then there's people's logs where like if Ken's working on stuff I know he was here this year I just look at Ken log and find all that stuff he did so it's like there's a way to track a whole team of people like up probably up to like a hundred or so people like if you want to absolutely completely collaborate like within one person's capacity is I think pretty much tracking kind of the number of people you can you can remember in your head which is Dunbar's number which is like about a hundred or two hundred and then but like all the different projects that are going on between all the people that's all trackable if you if you kind of follow this technique it takes a little bit of time to study it but once you get it you can completely collaborate on a large scale across time and when we say across time we're not just saying for this summer it's like this is going to be we can look at, at this back in a decade and, and still make contributions to it or fork it or make new improvements and make different versions and stuff like that and it does happen already like universal rotor for example pulling up stuff from 2010 and you know stuff like that so um there is there's is some sense to it but okay so with the filament maker um Let's take a look at the concept and then go to, I uh, actually didn't upload the, the cat yet. Well, the wiki was crashing on me. So the concept, okay, so that's kind of like the latest simple, the OSC simple extruder where uh, before we had this kind of stuff. So this is our working dock on the large 3D printer. This one you see right here on the right, that's the one we took apart. It works, but it's it's not a robust thing. It's it's our first version. That's the Lyman filament maker. We actually got Hugh Lyman to build it for us and he shipped it over. But that's got a small half inch nozzle, half inch uh, tube. It works only with very finely controlled pellets. This is not like for trash printing. Uh, so it's a small nice nice iteration. We pulled a few spools of filament out of that and uh, called it a day. And then just looking at the whole design, <clears throat> the next iteration on this is 
just use our universal controller. Here we're using, there's a heater band and there's a temperature controller. Well, cool, those are extra parts. We can, we might as well do it out, out of our own universal controller since we already have that. You know, you've got all those components that are hidden behind there, the power supply and, and power elements and this and that. It's all hidden back there, but we already have all of that in the universal controller, so we might as well use that. All we need to do is control temperature or two. In our next iteration, we'll do like uh, four bands on a tube, on a barrel. We'll do, so we can actually use the two out, the heat sensors on the, on a ramps board. There's the extruder heater and the a bed heater. We can simply go with those in the menu. We can say, okay, set the temperature of this one to this and the next one to whatever, like 230 to melt whatever plastic. So you can have two zones, like yeah, so readily. Does it make sense to have two zones? It does. Transition, so it's got a bit more friction at the top. Well, you want to do it press. possibly to where you're more or less preheating, but under the glass transition temperature, and then you're going into the hot zone where you already got enough energy in there, but you're just taking it to the, to the top, to the melt. Or maybe we just set both of them like most you know like kind of load them quite a bit together maybe make the first one a little lower than the second one or i mean we have to kind of figure this kind of parameters out would there be any reason to actually put like a a little fan or something at the top of it to keep it from the top of the tube to stop it actually just heating the tube all the way up and making uh, that's it really all the way that's possible and we'll see i think that's the kind of thing you want to look at once you get the actual yeah, output yeah, because the ideal thing is you turn this thing on, heat it, and literally by the force of gravity, you should be starting to extrude, just ooze out. So when you turn on the motor, you get more pressure and you get the finely controlled filament. Here, the idea is to have interchangeable nozzles that you can do whatever filament kind of size you want. For prototyping, like say you want to run it faster or slower, you might find that a particular nozzle size works just the best for getting you the most consistency. But the way to think about it is the motor's not really doing the driving here. It's the heat that's that's melting it and making it happen. In uh, the precious plastic, so this is kind of uh, precious plastic are the other guys that have a pretty good version of it. Um, and you can study that. It's a good study because we're pretty much doing what they are. Uh, so precious plastic. If I understand injection molding, if I understand correctly, yeah. that that what does the liquefying by pressure in the sense of this screw. But we're not doing that. So no. The heat does the work, so not the pressure. Yeah, and we have gravity working for us. So in our configuration, nobody does that doing uh, going vertically down. Uh, if you're horizontal, you obviously need, I mean, you need the force of the screw to press it. But here, then we get away with using less energy and uh, smaller motors. So I think that's, that is a good idea. Just let the nature, let physical factors work for you. Because then you have this even, evenly heated thing. Whereas, like, if you're heating a tube, I mean, well, gravity makes it fall down towards the bottom part of the screw when you're screwing it. So... Uh, it's less, I would say it's probably less even if you're going horizontal unless you've got nice tight fill. Uh, but just, just like loading it all down by gravity to the tip, like you're closing off all the air gaps, so you're not relying so much on the on the screw to to get that controlled motion. You're, you're letting gravity do it, which is, to me, that sounds pretty good. It worked well last time. And um, for... Yeah. Uh, you can adjust it through temperatures, and if we control the motor speed, right now we're just turning on the motor. There is no speed control on the motor, but there's temperature and nozzle size that will control how much you're actually getting for the thickness. And also there's cooling fans we can add after the filament escapes, and that can also control uh, some parameters like how fast, well, what kind of thickness you actually extrude that before it cools. Like So there's a little control through that, but mainly through the temperature and the orifice size. Obviously, if you know the smaller hole you have, the less diameter you're going to push through, the larger, the larger it's going to be. 
And the thing that's a critical thing is we don't really care if we're off that magic 2.85. What we care about, like we don't care about a specific number, we care about consistency. Why is that? So, so say we got a big run of film and we ran it overnight and everything just came out to be exactly 2.7. We got 10 spools of that. We ran, you know, we had a, had a production run. Well, so what? Put it into Cura. There's settings for film and diameter. That already adjusted perfectly. So as long as you're within the nozzle thickness of your printer, which is 3 millimeters, you're good to go. You want it to be as close to 2.85 or 3. 2.85, which is under 3. So if you have over 3, like you're going to get a jam. So there, you're a little under 3, typically. That's what you want, so you can feed through, actually. Okay. Uh, so the only disadvantage of having off the 2.85 is that you fill less of the neck. And if you're too thin, like, for example, running 1.85 in a 3 millimeter nozzle system, in a 3 millimeter heater tube thing, you can it's easier to get jams because if you're retracting and, and going forward you can get this back up because you want this whole plunger of filament filling up the whole yeah. circumference of what you have but at the level like say we get perfection at 2.7 uh, millimeters uh, or for some reason we have this sweet spot where we're just getting to you know just a nominal number 2.7 as our as our for some reason we get that with this kind of uh, uh, material then we can say okay we set that in cura for one cool we're pretty close to 2.85 but then also we can say okay well if we find that we're building housing and now we've got this whole cluster of printers and we got everything at 2.2.7 we'll just make our nozzles or make our um, extruders 2.7 or you know a little smaller because we can do that we we can take an existing uh, nozzle you can take, for example, a 1.85 millimeter nozzle, drill it out with a 1.7 or 1.8 millimeter drill bit. That's completely doable. That's a pretty easy thing. So we kind of have the control. Like we don't need to be like, oh, we need to be 2.85 sharp on this. We're cool, but we want to be consistent. But also with the consistency, how much consistency do you need, right? So what does consistency mean? That well, it means that. For example, if you have 20% infill, if you're expecting to be running at 2.85 millimeter diameter and you actually have 2.95, well, that's only a few percent off where you're going to get, the only way it's going to be visible is on the edges. You might see like little extra unevenness because you got more, but on the inside, it's actually going to help you. You're pressing more, you've got 20% infill and you're actually getting more filament in there and you don't see it and it's actually stronger. So you don't really care, especially if it's big parts where such a small percentage, like say on, on your wall module that you're actually printing, you don't care. Like think about dimensional lumber, two by fours. They can be off like a whole bunch, like more than that little five or 10% that we're talking about right here. So, I mean, we've had, uh, like if you guys remember, we had the two by 12s that were all uh, not 11.25, but 11.5 in one batch, you know? So uh, we're allowed a little bit of this leeway here. So because we're trying to go from, for a complete trash, like the dregs of civilization here, we're going to burn it down and <laughs> melt it down and rebuild it into uh, usable material. At that point, you want to have max control over all the variables and you want to be able to deal with inconsistency or, or the irregularities that we're going to go into because we're dealing with all kinds of filaments. And if you want this filament maker to be used for just about everything, you'll have to accept a lot of ver variables such as like when I, what I mentioned, the 2.7 diameter for maybe polycarbonate does that to us. But ABS turns out to work well at 2.8 for some reason. It's all like the flow characteristics and all this. This is whole science of materials where there's infinite number of plastics. I mean, that's, that's a start. So um, we're allowing for this kind of... A, we're designing for a system that's robust that can handle all this kind of stuff, uh, including like how we're shredding. Like we can shred, we can put screens into our shredder to make very small fill, small particle size, um, or larger, depending how we need it. But if you want to study 
what's already out there there is good work uh, for example sh uh, so filament well extruder extruder um, to see what they do and then build upon it so <coughs> like in this in this extruder here so um, yeah take a look at the side it's it's pretty good like this this shredder here um, basic pro let's look at the pro machines here so what they're doing here so here in there uh, let's see let's go to this one here Extrusion Pro. Full instructions. That's pretty good. But what you see there, they've got this big motor with a huge gear down. There, because they're actually using it for injection molding. Uh, that's not what we're doing. We've got a much smaller motor. Uh, they still got like they got like six heat bands, and looks like they got three zones of temperature control. Two or three, I forget. But they can do things like this. They can actually pack a tube with plastic because that's got so much force. They actually have a real screw there, like a, a precision, well, just a formal extruder screw. We're just using an auger bit. All we're doing in our case is we just need to help that plastic move a little bit. As long as we can do that consistently, we're good. So we're not doing what they're doing here, uh, just for reference. So what are we doing? Um... <clears throat> so so this is the concept it's this big hopper a motor coupler uh, heater barrel band heaters band heaters band heaters like four of them uh, since we have a one inch pipe and what what's the length of that drill bit 18 total no, with 12. like 12 of uh, flutes oh 12 of yeah it's 12 and a half I think of actual drill bit and then the shank is Another six or Four so? Or six. Okay. So something that looks like this. Here we've got also the nozzle where you have the ability to screw in different nozzles of different sizes. We've got a few. So that would be basically like take your one inch pipe, um, thread it down, not thread it down, but put in a fitting that has a half inch. So do a, a one inch to half inch and then screw in your nozzles that you can drill out to whatever size you need. We've got a few different nozzles here already from the previous work. And then we can do try some fans. So like in the CAD, this is what it actually... I, I just decided this. I couldn't upload it, but it's it's uh, all uploaded. Basically, I thought about, okay, there you go. Do a polycarbonate front screen so you see how much stuff you've got inside. You've got a wood backing board. You've got two by sixes. You've got metal plates on top and bottom. So, sorry, I can't rotate that, it's 2D. But on the bottom where the tube attaches, that's the, that's the only sensitive part where you're hot there. So you wanna have a metal plate, and there's actually, you're talking about fans. Yeah, we could probably use a fan under that bottom plate, which we would make like um, eighth inch or quarter inch steel. And the rest of this here is, that's two by six lumber for the hopper. You've got a coupler connecting the motor that we have, and uh, what I would do actually for the end of the drill bit, maybe dull it up a little bit and let it rest at the bottom or something like that. So, and it doesn't spin too fast. Um, it will have resistance where the, when you're going against the plastic, it will tend to push the bit up. So, uh, depending on how strong that coupler feels to us, we might put in an extra bearing here in collar if there's a shaft space on the actual shank which we could do for example is that a hex shank throughout or is it round at the not the entire way but the main part of it is hex yeah there's a part that's hex which where you question okay how do i get a hex bearing of that particular size well what we could do is for example take a we do have one inch hex bearings we can 3d print a, an insert to grab the shank and actually put a set screw in there to do something like a collar which prevents the shaft, it basically holds it from axial thrust, meaning pressing against the shaft of the motor or going down too much and wearing out your tube at the bottom or something. Uh, so we could try holding it. But I mean, initially we, we can probably run it uh, the way they have it in the Lyman version of this. They had it 
where um, <clears throat> there was a little, like if Benny opened it up, there was a little thrust washer there where uh, the actual shank of the auger was held in place. It was prevented from going into the motor yeah, a by this little bearing. Uh, so that, that is a good idea, by all means. We probably, uh, I would maybe just start it, see how it runs with, we do have nice couplers for the motor, which is already half inch shank. So it's, that's a pretty good connection. I'm not sure we're gonna need more thrust bearings on that. Uh, here, I think for the precious plastic version, um, first they use, well, they, they have a, an aluminum coupler with very small set screws. I'm not sure we're going to need it with what we have. We do have a nice coupler for this particular shaft. We're going to weld up basically. A, we have a, it's actually a 12 millimeter coupler on the motor. The motor is 12 millimeters. And we're going to hex. How do you do it? Well, a coupler welded to a hex socket bit, which we actually, we tested that. We have a bunch of bits that fit that so you can get a nice welded coupler. That's like the most critical part. Like, can you drive this shaft uh, without nothing? <clears throat> so we're welding the, the socket um, piece onto the coupler. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we are. So um, socket, so motor coupler to so socket. Um, I mean, it's a simple thing. So you take, so if you Google online, like what are we talking about a socket? Like, uh, just take, take a, so like one of these socket. Yeah, there's these things, images online. Let's, let's grab that, grab an image. So we're gonna take, you know, one, like this we're actually gonna take one that's got a thin upper part like more like uh, one that in practice looks more like these where they have a thin part and a thicker part so the thin part is gonna go on to let's let's uh, take a little screenshot it's it's gonna be like one of these here uh, maybe like oh, I could take this one something like this so what are we doing there <clears throat> um, that's gonna go to here do we have decent, um, yeah I'm just looking at passing down a 2 by 6 with a hole in it like that doesn't look like potentially a very strong structure you've got a bunch of screws in the back Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, if you look at. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering if, if that bottom plate where the drill that actually goes through is steel, I kind of wonder if those side plates shouldn't also be. Metal. You can, but it's just much more. It's more work. Uh, you can minimize that hole size. All you need to do is make sure that stuff falls in there. Um, I wouldn't make. <coughs> too big a deal from that if there's a solid board on the back and then you're covering the front so what is what is what are you resisting here you're resisting the the torque of the motor against the resistance of the plastic where as we said like if you get the temperature to do the work for you of course there shouldn't be a yeah, lot much what you have so effectively what are you holding that with you've got about 10 inches of plate at a two by four where, where it's got you're screwed in from the back with like a three inch screw so you got a few screws uh back there yeah my only you can actually was just the, the rib um in the thin part of the two by four that it's all basically through that that ceases to be the case if the the plate that we have here i just drew like polycarbonate because i could actually wanted to see like okay how much yeah, fill cool. level 
mean, it's, it's not. It's good to see that it's that you're not getting a jam. Or yeah, it's not too heavy, but like, if we question that, you can put a bar across that, and that completely yeah, stabilizes. Exactly. Sure. But if you look at the numbers of the motor, what kind of forces are you resisting here? Uh, my estimate would be like 10 pounds. So you look at, uh, this is where calculations come in, but you look at the specs of the motor, which are, um, do you want to look at that number or not really right now? Do, do we want to look at the specs of the motor to see what force we have to resist from the rotation? Torque would be interesting, I guess. So, under Lyman Filament Maker, we've got all these specs like uh, let's see for motor. Yeah, let's see, there's, uh, so fidgets is, that's where that motor, well, let's look at the BOM of the filament maker. That, that link is in here. Let's go to the BOM. <clears throat> There's this 15. I know this is at fidgets.com. Um, How standard are these parts kind of you're dealing with the motor and stuff? You, know, you can find it all over there you go. North America or something? Worldwide. Yeah, I mean, you'll have, well, as far as this is Fidgets, for example, a company in America, but you'll have something equivalent. You can use the NEMA 23 motor. But look at this, 173 kilogram centimeter is the torque. So the question is, how much force are you putting against the 2x4? Now uh, that's 2x6, that's back there. Um, it's at the screws are attached at five inches or 12.5 centimeters so radial distance therefore the torque the force at that point is this number divided by 12.5 so you go like 173 divided by 12 you got 14 kilograms at the motor at the attachment point I mean that's that's nothing you've got um, but think about it as you've got attachment screws there at least four screws I mean that's absolute minimum each screw holds 300 pounds as the rating of a of a standard deck screw uh, in terms yeah, of clamp force it's like just a, a single screw will hold us down by a factor of, of 10 so now the as wood breaking as, as long as that rib where the hole is cut out 
I mean, you're saying screwing in from the back side, probably need to screw in from the front side. Yeah, too. but we already have the board that you're attaching this whole assembly to. You're also transferring the force through the entire back. Yeah, I'm not concerned about that side. Yeah, but I'm saying it's connected to that. That's why you're, if you analyze all the forces here, that is also holding everything together. So. But if there's a screw mm. coming in from the back side, we also need to probably just do in the front side of that U, because the tendency of where that's going to break is in the grain line of um, that, like, the top of the horseshoe. Like. Yeah, we can make those those flanges. There I made, like, a minimum of, like, two inches or so, uh, which is not a lot. Um, but you got steel at the bottom. The steel is attached to... If we're like if, if there's a concern on that, you can do actually like a vert like you can slap a two by four across this and that, or like just vertically here to completely get the tie in between the top plate and the bottom plate. In the case that there's some weaknesses in the screws getting screwed in through the back of this board, which would be like five eighths inch or three quarter inch plywood or something like ex that exterior plywood we have. Um, so no, I, I I mean you'll see it. Uh, the thing won't move. It's going to be pretty solid. Yeah, I was just thinking like that design <clears> stuff. Like that's the point where maybe. Oh yeah, in this one, yeah, this is like I'm, yeah, this this is like first super quick prototype to get everything functional, highly functional. Um, so not, I mean, in a formal version, I would not use wood. I would because uh, there's heater elements here. That's fire risk. So. Uh, the eventual version use metal um, yeah more metal uh, for prototyping wood is actually quite convenient like for things like this you want to do that um, so then um, so this has got if you notice on that well we can link to the motor That's gonna be that. Okay. Um, simple idea. So that's that's pretty much the extruder. And what's the idea there? You've got this big hot like. Okay. So just to analyze, like I, I looked at this. Okay. Cool. You got your little funnel there for the hopper. I was like, okay. I still need a hopper here. Why don't we just add a backboard to it? Hang everything on it. Make that backboard part of the hopper. You know, just trying trying to say, uh, kind of had this design here but I just went forward and this is what I came up with uh, last night oh there's a little fan fan elements at the bottom there so if the filament is extruding from the bottom you can cool it or maybe we don't need the cooling maybe you actually want that little bit more of elongation there uh, that will probably control a little bit on your filament diameter I mean this is all a bunch of playing with yeah. actual materials to see what what the specific parameters are um, those fans could be turned on by our universal control but here we can have two zones of heating out of the box I do believe the Marlin is set up for three temperature inputs so we could get stock Marlin to do up to three zones if you you'd have to change some lines and configuration and uh, configuration files um, Two heaters into one connector? Yeah. Sure, if you run them in parallel, yeah. you just uh, drawing double the current. These are only like 100 or 200 watt bands, so they're not like a kilowatt or something like that each. They're pretty benign, like a couple of hundred watts. So we have like 800 watts of heating power. For comparison, your extruder does 40 watts. So here we got like way more power than our extruder, and we already know that the extruder can get you extrusion. Uh, we normally go with 1.2 millimeter filament, and if we go slower, you could probably extrude. Uh, yeah, nozzle like even larger um, nozzle diameters. So 400 watts or like 800 watts, that's like plenty of power to the point where we're just melting the thing. I mean, I'd be curious to see if when you're just melting it. 
and you've got this vertical configuration is that enough i mean there's that gravity of all that mass like you see the extruder on our printers oozing like it does when you stop i mean this might not even need to run the motor or something we'll, we'll see um I mean, think about it if you had a large, I mean, there's different configurations you can think about. You can think about it in the regime, I'm going to push it as hard as possible through a smaller nozzle. When the filament comes out, it actually expands a little bit. So actually, when you're wanting 2.8, you probably are doing, I think the way it works, you got a slightly smaller nozzle diameter. I'm not, I'm not sure, I, I can't remember. But you can do the regime where you're trying to press hard, and once it expands, once it goes out the nozzle, this... Um, the filament maker nozzle it will actually expand because pressure has been reduced so it it's got built up pressure pressure reduced after you escaped your filament is likely to expand then you can think about the other regime where we're like not pushing with the motor at all we put a larger nozzle like three millimeters or four millimeter nozzle easy to drill out with a drill bit and just let it feed by gravity and then when it sh goes through it might kind of uh, lengthen out by gravity because it's hot, because it's so hot. So uh, it could be different regimes that, that could work. And maybe like we discover that we actually want to do an even longer nozzle with more heating and actually no motor drive, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, that's a possibility because um, that may work for some things. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, typically you want some pressure behind behind your... Filament, imagine but note it, that the heat will do all the work for also you. Also, imagine from continuity of, of your filament, if it's different plastics going in, you kind of want to mix it up. That the older is going to mix oh, yeah. it more homogeneously. That's you know, there you go. I mean, for the application where you're actually mixing a whole bunch of different stuff, yes. Otherwise, you'll not be homogeneous. Uh, there's details on the nozzle here in the precious plastic version. They actually have. A little screen to keep out well actually to even out the pressure because they're used to uh, sending a lot of pressure through their system so they actually have a screen with little holes they just insert a little plate at the end I mean we're not gonna do that but they do have a nice feature which is that, just hmm? what does that do? it evens out the pressure at the end of the tube so if you're injecting they'll probably get you a nice like say you're injecting into some shape it'll even out the pressure to Get you a better pressure profile as opposed to like one part yeah. uh, pushing more than another so for an uneven fill here they do have like you can hardly see it but there is a tiny little screw uh, you can see that little screw there they threaded a hole and put in a screw there so I can actually close down the aperture if you want lower flow we can try that um, just yeah it's just a screw you're just blocking the entrance the exit if you want more or less flow so you just have another level of control there I'm not sure if we need that in the first run that we do uh, maybe we can put on a nozzle that has that built in so we can screw in different things to the end so we can I mean we can do this kind of stuff they have that in their official precious plastic release so it's just a thing to think about but that's pretty much it the biggest thing being um, coupling I mean the biggest challenge here is couple that motor effectively and there you go you have to watch where the like the length of the, the actual heat tube you don't want the the uh, the auger to end up too far away from the end if you're relying on it for pressure so you want it to be like I don't know like a half an inch or quarter inch from the very end so it's actually pressing effectively as opposed to like ending up somewhere halfway in the tube and you're pressing hard but then you got all that friction afterwards if you're in a regime where you want want to do a lot of pressing yeah. So, so just a small note, we talked about putting some little angled wood pieces inside the reservoir to make sure that there's no material collection in the corners and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like a simple little thing you can add in there that makes a difference. And just do the miter cuts on the way those um, two yeah, pieces come in, tie into the... I mean, what you're price. saving there is you're yeah. saving yourself, you got... Um, Personally, I wouldn't bother for the reason that you're saving yourself this volume. This volume compared to the entire volume of the hopper is pretty much insignificant. But if you want that kind of tight control for like switching between materials, 
yes, that's a good idea. You will get cleaner. But the assumption here is like I would just open up the, the front and just clean it out. Um, you should probably want to clean this out sometimes anyway. Uh, I like the idea of the transparent face so you can clean things out readily, like as opposed to yeah, this thing. How do you, how do you open that up? You pretty much have to take it off and like do it upside down. You can't really access the stuff that's in a hopper. So, I mean, this this simple kind of design here, this tra design for transparency, that's it's going to be very handy because we're going to be messing with all kinds of mixtures and cleaning this thing out, modifying it, and so forth. So, um, it's a good deal. There, just put a few screws here and have that accessible, or put like a little door in there, a little latch or something, if you want to do like a little smaller door that you take off, so you don't have to take off the entire thing. And I guess there's, not gonna, there's really not going to be a lot of force pushing it out on the, on the, the walls. Like uh, the walls of what? Like, I don't know, like, pipe? like if they're plastic or something, it's not... Oh. It's That's like just the weight of the plastic. There's you know, it's kind of just like grabbing it and pulling into the tube. It's not going to be like... Pressing. Yeah. Right. If, if it bulges, put a board across this thing. Um, so how are we going to wire this up? What do you do? You got these heater bands. They're 120. Just simple off-the-shelf heater bands accessible anywhere. Is there a concern that material gets between the pipe wall and the screw? I mean, that in the, the so actually what, friction and stuff, or what not? Too much like if you don't have heat, yeah. I mean, this thing will basically be a solid thing that you don't want to turn this on without heat. It would be good yeah, to have some kind of a heat lockout. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like burn out the motor, or like first thing is the shaft could even break because that motor is relatively, I mean, 14. Nah, no. that probably won't. I ain't going to break it, but. I mean, it's stronger than you can hold with your hand, but yeah, yeah I don't think it's going to break that. But then again, like the, like if you dr drive it like the, the far end, if there was like a little bit of plastic left and you have all that length that's open and you've got those thin flutes at the end, that could possibly break that like at the tip there. Not, I wouldn't say it would break at the shaft there, but those flutes are pretty, like they get pretty narrow there as far as the meat of metal that's in there. 16 kilos per... Six, 16 kilos at one centimeter, yeah, it's not a lot. Well, no, 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 hold on, hold on. That's, that's called, no, actually we're going to, let's revisit that. So we said, uh, let's write that down. So about, so we did that calculation, uh, no, 10x that, why? Because you're talking about a one inch radius, not a tw not a uh, one centimeter radius, not a 12 centimeter radius. 12 centimeters is where the screws are attached. One centimeter is where the shaft is pushing. The attachment point is gonna have, the farther out you are, the less you have to hold that thing. That's why like augers have wide hand, handles. See what I'm saying? Like when we did that calculation before, we we're looking at this point. There. That's the attachment of the screws. Now we're looking at the point much closer. We're looking there at that radius. That's 10x force, more than 10x. So we're talking once again 168 kilos. Yeah, you'll easily break that. Yeah, at one centimeter. What's the specs of that motor? Look, look back at the specs. Yeah. 168 kilos, 170 kilos at one centimeter. Yeah, you break that thing pretty quick. But um, they tear apart the machine, but I don't break. But the that's where you. That's we where have a you, solid coupler. That's where you need. It won't tear apart machine because we said it's we're holding it and you got like 16 kilos to hold at the attachment points. But that's where that that whole bottom plate needing the side walls going up into a top plate that the motor is connecting to. Um, that's where the force actually would be. But we're never going to have that anyway because you would turn it on and heat it up properly. That's yeah. 
Extra credit for that assignment for you later on FreeCAD FEA analysis. FreeCAD FEA analysis. FreeCAD has finite element analysis where you can simulate the forces. Okay. It's got advanced engineering capacity. You can actually put that in and say, play, this is the force we're applying at that point. How is yeah. that going to deform the entire thing based on known material properties? That's all doable. Uh, extra credit. I've, I've never played with it. I, I'm waiting for somebody to teach us to do that. Like, because you. There's a learning curve to that. I want a good tutorial on it. There's some pretty good tutorials on it already out there. You can do very basic things pretty quickly. No, it's, it's not a big deal. It's like an hour or two learning. Um, uh, with our universal controller. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the way we're using it now in the 3D printers, you can't move your extruder before you heat. Oh, we look into that. Like that there's yeah. solutions for you. Uh, right, you'd have to go into the code for that, so, but, well, but we're not doing that. But what I'm saying is that it's already configured for that, so, in other words, uh, if we use it the same way, then you have to heat first before you can actually move your motor. Well, right? Yeah, but the motor, we're not, we weren't controlling through the controller, we were just going to do, like, hit the fan on, oh. and that would control the turn on of the motor, so... We're not using stepper motors. Like, yeah, the stepper motors would be locked out. Like, say, you connect it to the extruder. Yeah. Those would be locked out, but not... Like, you can still control another pin if the temperature is not high. So... Now, of course, you can modify the firmware and all that to do whatever you need to do, but we're just saying we're, we're just hacking Marlin back and forth for different projects. And, yeah, of course, you'd, you know, get someone software person to now this is our OSE shredder firmware etc I want to actually migrate to the universal controller for the brick press because if we're already building one thing like why do I want to get all these other components for this dedicated box so that I mean and then you are actually quite convenient you can select okay full brick height half brick height and you can do that all through the little LCD and still having a bunch of knobs right now we use a mechanical switch where you switch between like for settings, well, that's a big part, a lot of wires. We already have all those wires in the controller, and you can do that through, that now controls your software um, through a simple screen. So that's more convenient. And also they have LCD touch screens for the same ramps. That's also quite convenient. Um, we're, not, we're just using the push button thing. But yeah, this would be, it's a nice little display here. <coughs> Um, What's the, what's the level of the components you're using in the system? The right, the heating elements are 120. This is uh, 24, I believe. 24V, so remember that. Um, so, yeah, the voltage levels are important because you don't want to put like 120 into this motor. You'll fry it immediately. Um, that's 24DC. And we can pull out the supply power supply that was with that already. These are 120 AC. So just pay attention to that, and we'll be how many watts did we'll be say? fine. I think like 200. Uh, it'll say like these ones, for example, here, 380 watts. Yeah, 380. M ours might be. If it's 380, it's like uh, about 3 amps or so of current. So the wires you need, like little phone wires, actually can handle that. Uh, not a lot of amperage, but there is uh, a lot of power because yeah, it's 120. Uh, I think the ones we have are 200, but just check. We'll, we'll say it on them. Um, what else? I think that's about it for the um, extru extruder part. 